welcome to the STR Data Lab. Hey, Jamie, we're recording. Are you there? Jamie, you ready? Hey, Scott. <laughs> what is this? Hey, it's Halloween. I, I thought we were doing costumes. I guess I missed that memo. <laughs> I guess I'll go get my hamburger outfit. <laughs> Maybe the hamburger and hot dogs, but you're looking great. You're ready. You're ready for trick or treating. I'm ready for a podcast, but uh, I guess we're we're not doing custom. I'm gonna, uh, take that off. We'll do that for later. <laughs> so let's start over. <laughs> Welcome to the STR Data Lab. I'm Jamie Lane, Chief Economist at AirDNA, and I'm joined today by my co-host and maybe future Hamburglar, uh, uh, Scott Page. <laughs> Happy Halloween, Jamie. Happy Halloween. That's a, that's a good plug. Nice cold open for people to go check us out on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been pushing hard on YouTube lately. It's it's been fun. So maybe give a quick rundown of like what this series is that we've been doing. Yeah, so obviously the STR Data Lab is on YouTube and you're becoming a little bit of a, a YouTube star or sensation here, if you will, with Jamie's Lane Change. So we now have uh, five episodes out at time of recording this today. And this uh, chronicles your experience of effectively putting your money where your mouth is. You talk STR data, you talk STRs, what it's like to host all the time. Now you're actually a host. So this uh, showcases your experience researching, purchasing, furnishing, and hosting your first Airbnb property. Yeah. Uh, but. With the caveat is we we're ho my wife and I were hosting back in like I think we started in like 2011 2012 uh, with a private room in our house. So I'd say this is our first for away into uh, an investment property on uh, sort of managing uh, a large home because we're now a month into it. Uh, three sets of guests, three five star reviews, which is let's be clear, three five stars. Three five stars. <laughs> you're mar you're marching towards the guest favorite. Marching towards guest favorite, but it is it has been a whole lot different. Sort of managing remotely and investing in a and as a large five bedroom home as opposed to hosting in our sort of private room in our house where we were able to interact with guests and sort of solve problems pretty easily. I would say some of the early anecdote or learnings that I've sort of had um, is that over communicating has been really helpful in sort of solving some of the problems. Like first guest was awesome. No problems. Uh, second guest, it was like 10 o'clock uh, leaving to Columbia the next morning on vacation at like 5 a.m. Uh, and get a, a message that the heating wasn't working. It always shows up at the best time. I like really, and what was is crazy is we had just replaced the entire HVAC system. Unfortunately, being October, like up until that point, it was just the AC, and this was really the first time of the heating kicking on. It was going to be forty degrees that night, and I realized that I hadn't actually tested the heating uh, after the HVAC had been repaired. So, uh, fortunately, like uh, the guest was cool with it is that a bad joke uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh we had the hvac team there first thing the next morning they just hadn't sort of bled the lines correctly on the on the gas they were able to get it fixed apologized um profusely actually offered a full refund of that night because they had a um and they actually didn't take me up on it I and mean, wow. they had such a great time at the property they're like they, they want to come back so it's the power of the pickleball court, I think. But <laughs> Jamie, what what you're what you're describing is the life of a host, and so we're going to do something a little bit different today than maybe what we've historically done on these episodes, where instead of just talking about the macro and data and a market review, we're going to talk about practical hosting tips and actions to maximize your investment as an Airbnb host. And we will share your experience doing this as you're new to the game. And then I can share some of my experiences having done this for you know, the past seven years as well. Yeah. So 
I maybe that would be a good reminder for listeners. So giving some of your history, you were in the property management game long before you came to AirDNA. So maybe a brief refresher of your sort of experience in the space. Sure. So dating back to really early 2017, bought my first property with with a friend that we lived in. And then we Airbnb Airbnb it while we traveled for work. And that's how we got into the game. Realized it was a ton of fun. It was a good business. So then we bought a couple more, grew my own portfolio. And then over the course of you know four or five years, built a property management company uh, managing over 200 properties. So I've kind of seen the full journey here from just individual hosts hosting my personal residence to true investment property to property management at scale. And so as we talk about these kind of tips and tricks, how to think about data to util- to improve your listing, it's something that I've made many mistakes along the way, Jamie. And now with, with AirDNA, hoping to uh, help alleviate and mitigate mistakes for other hosts. Yeah. No, and... So you were sort of laughing of like, yeah, that's typical when I was sharing sort of the heating uh, problem. Uh, <laughs> what maybe before we get into some of these sort of tips and tricks, like, do you have any like quick sort of horror stories on like how things <laughs> can go like I, terribly oh, wrong? Yeah. I do have horror stories. I don't think quick is the right description. I, I okay. will just maybe give a teaser that our third guest ever. And this was still when it was our primary residence, broke all the locks on our uh, closets and private spaces and effectively robbed us. So with that said, that was our third <laughs> guest ever. And here I am committing to the short term rental game. So that just shows my conviction in this space. Also, lesson learned for me of just investment property versus primary residence and, and being careful about what we're offering up. Yeah. But yes, plenty of horror stories. And look, that that's part of this asset class. There's going to be a handful, some small percentage of guests that unfortunately don't follow the rules or have a negative experience. And how can you proactively mitigate against that as part of the game? All right, well, let's talk, let's talk data. This is the STR data lab. And so how are we, how can you as a new host or any host, regardless of property count, utilize data to improve their earnings and their return on their investment? And so let's maybe start kind of back to the basics, Jamie. As you get into this and as a host is operating, walk us through maybe a snapshot of the key metrics to first even evaluate success. So what is success criteria from a data standpoint as they're looking at the performance of their listing? Yeah. Um, So maybe we'll start with um, revenue. Always start with revenue. (laughs) And, And there's a reason to start with revenue. And one, it's and if you go into your sort of Airbnb host page, uh, analytics page, if you go into any sort of property management system, it's the number that is sort of reported to you. And very clearly in terms of this is your earnings. Uh, this is, and it's typically reported on an earnings per reservation basis uh, or your earnings over the past month. Uh, and these are really important sort of overall bookmarks, book benchmarks of essentially what your earnings were over any given period and are pretty easily sort of benchmarked against in mean, prior months uh, and against your competition. Because there's going to be a lot that goes into that revenue, sort of the occupancy to ADR metrics that we'll talk about in a second. But at the end, like you can adjust your pricing strategy to increase occupancy. You can adjust uh, to sort of charge higher rates and decrease. Uh, you can sort of and move what you want around sort of lead times and how far in advance you're trying to get people to book. But in the end, like as you sort of uh, and get through to the end of the month, you earned a certain amount of revenue. And that's going to be really, in a lot of ways, your score of how well you did in comparing yourself throughout the year into prior years. And there are two kind of key components of revenue, Jamie, right? Occupancy and ADR or price per night. And then, of course, you also have, you started to allude to it, but give us give us some context as well on booking window and lead time. Yeah. So booking window and lead time sort of work together. And as I'm thinking about my booking window, it can change dramatically by season and change dramatically by the market that you're in. So how I, I like to think about it in, in terms of the extremes. So 
uh, let's say I'm sitting here in Atlanta uh, and a typical booking window here in Atlanta is about two to three weeks. I That's how far in advance people are booking their reservations in that market. So outside of two to three weeks, like, yeah, I might get an occasional booking here and there, but my pricing for the next two to three weeks is going to be the most important for what ultimately sort of drives revenue at my property and how I manage prices prices through that booking window, i.e. the time when people are actually actively booking, is going to be really important. As opposed to maybe a vacation rental market, and my favorite example is like the Outer Banks, where during the summer, a typical guest is going to book two, three, even four months out in advance. And once you get into maybe that last two to three weeks, like you're not going to see any subsequent bookings for that property because of how remote it is. People book those trips really far out in advance. So there the booking window is like that three to four month window out that I need to be actively managing rates for that time out in the future and managing and how I'm sort of increasing, decreasing rates, benchmarking performance that far out and really paying attention uh, to sort of booking activity. It's it's so important because it's something that we talk about from like a macro data standpoint when we're looking at market performance, Jamie. But if you if you don't have an understanding of this as an Airbnb host, it's nearly impossible to maximize your revenue, which again, we started with intentionally. That's the goal is to drive revenue. And if you're mismanaging the lead time or the or the booking window to match the lead time for for reservations, there's going to be a mismatch in terms of what you ultimately earn. And so that's, again, just the theme for us today is reinforcing the importance of getting perspective and getting clarity on the performance of your listing. And so those are all important kind of outputs. You know, there are some inputs as well, such as minimum nights. So setting your minimum night strategy and how are guests typically booking in your particular market, like understanding that information is very, very important. And then maybe the the holy grail as well, which kind of starts to kind of, as I think about this, starts the flywheel effect for occupancy and revenue, which is reviews. You talked about at the start. I was like, the first thing you said, Jamie, right? So your instincts are correct. You said you had three five-star reviews. Like that's going to start the flywheel of showing up more in search, getting booked more often, commanding a higher price and driving more revenue. And so revenue, ADR, occupancy, lead time, minimum nights, reviews, six key metrics. Sound good? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. This is maybe a good opportunity you know, to, for us to share with the audience something we're both extremely excited about. We've been working on for a while at AirDNA. We just launched the beta version of it, which is a performance dashboard where you can go look at all of this in real time, free and, s- and simply connect your listing to get all that information served to you in one simple view. And this is something that I would have, I would have loved to have when I first started out back in 2017 or 18, Jamie. But moving on here, this is only as good. It's like, that data and those insights are only as good as the underlying data. So the ingredients leading into those insights. And so help us help all of us understand the importance of a comp set and the underlying data set driving these insights. Yeah. And it, it it's funny. It's like having started now and in, in digging into all the new insights that Airbnb provides, like they like have all these sections around benchmarks for your property on like lead times, reviews, wish lists, all these things. But it's all like, I've got to trust that, oh, they're just providing some benchmarks around the market. I'm like, well, how do you define my market? And like, what properties are you using? Are you using all five bedrooms like to compare with mine? Are you like, I spent so much time coming up with my comp set when I was looking to buy the property of like evaluating every single property attribute, how the reviews were, where the property was, and actually building that into a saved list within AirDNA. So like, I know the properties now. I'm tracking their performance on any given month on what they're earning in terms of occupancy, ADR, RevPars, being able to compare that with against what 
I know I'm earning in my property. Like it really like <laughs> I'm having the tools to select that comp set of like being able to sort of filter down by bedroom count, property type, uh, by amenities, uh, by review scores, number of reviews, like how often they're available or not. When you were sort of looking back at and when you got started, like how were you coming up with the properties that you were comparing your properties against or were you comparing performance against other properties? I was, but it was so manual and tedious, Jamie. And and actually, as I, as I still talk to other hosts today, this is a common behavior, which is going into Airbnb, doing a search for effectively like my city market zip code or address as if I was a guest. And then going onto the map and clicking into each individual listing and kind of building in my head, what I ended up doing was actually building a spreadsheet and linked out to those. Of course um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but then I would go in there on like a, first it was monthly, then it became weekly. And then once I felt like I had a good understanding, but I would go look and see like, all right, what are they charging per night? What's their cleaning fee? What amenities do they have that I don't or don't have that I do? What kind of reservation policies do they have? When's their check-in, check-out time? How are their quality of photos? What are their reviews, review scores? What are guests saying about their stay? And so I just did a lot of manual work to try to go find that information. It takes time and energy, but it certainly improved the performance of my listing because I had clarity and recognition of what my comp set was. And so now the ability to maybe move outside of the spreadsheet save those within a platform that you can go back and access them, see the list of every property and that you've done using save filters to be able to understand if there's new properties that are coming in that sort of meet that criteria and that you should be considering as, and we know supply just changes massively in any given market at any given time. And then sort of linking it to those metrics that you care most about i.e. how are rates changing on a go-forward basis for each property? Uh, how uh, are each of those properties booking out into the future? So when we look at the booking window and uh, how many nights have gotten booked from the comp set, how many nights are still available? And then for those properties that are still available, how are they pricing those nights? If you're still unavailable, uh, are still available so that you know how you maybe need to adjust your strategy going forward. Without a doubt. And I mean, I think as I reflect, I I told you earlier, I I made a lot of mistakes, right? I I was definitely leaving money on the table by not doing this exercise early on in my hosting journey. A tangible example of that was the market I was in had had a handful of large compression nights or compression events, meaning big events, high demand, spike in ADR. And I wasn't aware of one of those events. And so I got booked at like 200 a night and I go look at my competition. They got booked at about 600 a night. And so I just like instantly leaving money on the table by not being aware of what my comp set is doing and how they're performing. And so as I evolved in my hosting and management career, obviously became a a student of the game and a a data disciple, if you will, (laughs) um, to utilize data to maximize, maximize my returns. Yeah. And so... And when you're thinking about setting comp sets today, what do you feel like things that people should be considering that maybe they're not considering if they're just maybe going on Airbnb and looking around at nearby properties? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you have the basics that Airbnb is probably going to get you there of just like the geography in the market. The next layer down, which is good but not great is bedroom bathroom count even more precise is is occupancy or or sorry um how many heads you can sleep effectively and then you can get a little bit more sophisticated and and compare how many reviews does it have so how long has it been active what kind of review score does it have so are you comparing yourself to a property that's like a 4.2 but you're listed at 4.9 like that's that's a poor comparison are you super host What kind of amenities do you have? You can start to layer and filter down multiple clicks below to get more precise on your comp set. And the more accurate you are, the the better you 
can evaluate performance against um, against your peers and, and other comps in the market. And, and the, by the way, the reason this is all important when we say comp set, whether or not you're competitive and you want to quote unquote beat your competition is actually not the conversation here. It's more to help you benchmark what guests are looking at when they're making a booking. And so the comp set is just there, the guest opportunity set. And so Jamie, if I wanted to go to North Georgia and I search for a particular date range for a you know, four or five bed property, right? There's probably seven or eight nearby properties I could book. And so that is is really the comp set to understand how you're performing relative to what a guest would see in your market. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it back to you here because this is also a similar exercise. We're talking about it from a hosting lens, but it's an exercise you should be doing before you even make that investment, no? Oh, yeah. I and mean, I mean, it is something that you use to set like what you want to invest in, right? So in evaluating what amenities you want to add in, and that was very clear when going through all the properties that I thought I'd be competing with. So what amenities are they offering? What rates are they getting today? What occupants are they driving? And if I want to maximize the return on the property, what do I need to do so that, I mean, essentially for me, it was like, I want to be able to charge the highest rate in the market. So if there's seven properties when someone does the search and I'm going to be at a rate that's higher than all the other properties. Like, what are the factors that could potentially cause them to book my property over the others? Because you could sort of go into each property and see the things that they were sort of doing well, what guests were talking about that they liked. So it was like making sure you have those things. And then is there anything that you can sort of go over the top to sort of make it where I mean, that it could cause them to book your property over the others? And and I've heard others sort of call it as amenity stacking of like, I mean, this property is that amenity. People really like it. This other property has this amenity that people really like it. Like if you're able to sort of combine those three or four things into one, like can you get significantly higher rate and higher occupancies because you're going to be sort of the choice property, the premier property that someone's going to book before all the others because you sort of check all the boxes. It's it's such a good point. And I think the heuristic sometimes I utilize when thinking about building my comp set is what is a guest, like almost do the guest search side of it. So if you were to go book a property in your market, what are you searching for? And treat those inputs as your comp set inputs. And so similar to all the variables we just listed on amenities, bedroom, bathroom, count, et cetera, that, that is the influence for your comp set. And so you can do it a number of different ways based on if you have a particular guest type or guest ICP or guests you want to attract, which is, you know, another part of this equation is, is really understanding the guests coming to your properties too. Yep. And then I mean, something that I've learned very quickly, and I hope my friends at Airbnb aren't, aren't listening, <laughs> is that like my ideal customer is in a lot of ways, probably not booking through Airbnb. So like I started, I'm launching on Airbnb, but quickly realized because like I got, <laughs> I mean, that I had to start dropping my rate, maybe more than I wanted to get all those initial bookings. Now I've launched on Verbo um, and I'm seeing I'm, that the type of property that I've launched is like really speaks to the Verbo sort of user, large home in a vacation rental market. I'm dedicated towards families and like that is front and center, like the type of user, the type of guest that's booking through Verbo. And then like I haven't listed on booking yet. I hope my friends at booking aren't listening, but <laughs> that I, I I promise by the next time we record, Scott, that I'll have been listed on 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 booking too. I was gonna um, say your your former friends at Airbnb and booking. <laughs> because I mean I know that there's, and I was listening to the booking.com call this today on their earnings call, like they've been growing pretty significantly in the U S and a big factor that they're seeing is that people that start searching for a hotel 
The fact that booking is one of the only ones now that surfaces short-term rentals on their platform alongside hotels. I and mean, someone starting with a hotel search, but then mid sort of search converting to a short-term rental option. And that that's I mean, not I'm mean, really doable on Airbnb and not yet really doable on Expedia. So I mean, that sort of mix of channels to get different I mean, sort of guest profiles, potentially booking your property, like I mean, can be really beneficial to maximizing your, your booking potential. Spot on, spot on, Jamie. And you know, we've been talking about understanding, getting clarity of your performance, recognizing these metrics and how you're performing relative to comp set. That's all great. That's sort of the what. The now what is, is you typically should use that information change a behavior, take an action, et cetera. I like to think of it as like, you know, taking your car in for a routine checkup, <laughs> like a multi-point <laughs> inspection. I know we all dread that, but sometimes that dread and getting that insight can be a good thing because you're recognizing there's a gap or something you're missing, an action you need to take to improve performance. And so it could be a number of things, but often a obvious one or an initial one would be pricing and your pricing strategy. So a lot of ways you can go about doing this, but walk us through how you think about now that you're in the seat hosting like your dynamic pricing and, and setting your pricing strategy based on performance. Yeah. And I can tell you <laughs> the first thing I did <laughs> even before I'm setting up my PMS was getting my dynamic pricing going. Cause I want to make sure like once that listing was live that I, I had sort of dialed in what my pricing, because unfortunately I was launching into peak season in my market. So I knew I, I had a really strong opportunity to get bookings quickly uh, because October is peak season in North Georgia, was launching right at the end of September and needed and wanted to get I and mean, fill up my calendar through October as quickly as possible. So uh, yeah, setting up the dynamic pricing, I'm uh, going ahead and doing a detailed review of, of I mean, sort of the major weekend nights that were available. What are the rates that other people are at? How could I come in just below them? Or I, I even went like 10, 20% below them because I knew like not having any reviews, I was going to have to use price as a factor to make sure that like I get booked. Like just how I had talked about like all the amenities that I think I'm going to be able to get the highest rate going forward knowing that I don't have reviews as I get started, like people are going to have to make a little bit of a leap and having, being able to beat people on price at the beginning, I think was really important. I think is a factor that people should consider as they launch their property that you're probably not going to be listing right away at the rate that you maybe underwrote your property. You've got to make sure you get those bookings coming in then establish yourself as a high review property. And then, and only then can you start to push the rate higher uh, and maybe above your comp set, given that you think you're going to hire, have a higher likelihood to get booked. And then you can be tracking that through Airbnb or a tool like uh, IntelliHost of like what your conversion rate is and tracking that conversion versus your competition. And you're only able to effectively do that if you have the understanding of where your comp set is performing and how they're pricing, right? And so that's, again, reinforcing the importance of something like AirDNA's performance dash, having that visibility to inform pricing. And using a tool like AirDNA's recommended rates, right, is one way to start getting visibility and perspective. There's other pricing tools out there you can utilize, but that's critical. So like pricing is one lever. We could probably spend, and frankly, Jamie, we should spend a whole other episode talking specifically about pricing. There's other actions you can take that are even simpler than like a full full pricing strategy. I'll share an example where when I first started, I, I, again, I go back to these mistakes. I thought it was a good idea to try to take a margin on my cleaning fee. <laughs> so I tried to make 10 <laughs> bucks on every clean. There's penny wise, pound foolish. Then I went and looked at my comp set and I was way overpriced relative to my comp set. And so I pulled down my cleaning fee to actually be more competitive and undercut the market and my bookings went up. So I made way more money doing that. And like something as simple, like that's a really simple change to make. I would have never, never known that if I hadn't looked at the data. 
or you can adjust other fees, reservation policies. Do you want to allow pets? Is all your comp set not pet friendly? But if you are and you're willing to tolerate that, that can be a massive uptick in occupancy and ADR. So there's a lot of actions you can take just by getting that initial information. And I, I have the scars to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and maybe that's and some of the benefit that I've had in learning from you and learning from from others sort of in this being in the space of like coming in with a cleaning fee, like I'm charging fifty dollars less than what my cleaner's charging me because I wanted that cleaning fee to be really competitive and and not be a reason for someone not to book. Cause when and right now the property is averaging a rate of like six hundred dollars a night, like fifty dollars this way or that, like in terms of getting a booking or not, like don't have that cleaning fee be a reason for someone to not book. Also on the cancellation policies of like coming in right away with a strict cancellation policy when like I mean, for better or worse, like everyone's got a really lenient policy now of like, know that there's some risk um, associated with um, cancellation, but hopefully being an overly communicative with people um, like, yes, things are going to come up, but ideally they, they don't cancel just because they, they don't like you <laughs> uh, or book another property that they see. Because a lot of times it's not that their plans change. It's that they see another property that's dropped their rate that they can get. And, and it's still within the cancellation window. So getting them really excited about coming to stay at your property and like communicating with them after the booking, but even before that sort of week up until the run up of their stay, when you might start sending them the info about sort of checking in of like sending them the guidebook, sending them sort of the recommendations on things to do and like all the things that they can, and it's going to make their stay really awesome at your property, like ways that you can sort of cement in of like, all right, <laughs> we're in it. We're in it for this property. All right. So Jamie, you've plugged your listing into uh, AirDNA's performance dashboard. Maybe just to, to close us out here, what's the one metric you're tracking most closely uh, for your listing's performance? Yeah, right now it's next 30 day occupancy. Like, I want to make sure that I am at or above my competition for that metric. I can tell you right now, my performance score is a 71. I'm watching that performance score uh, every week. And it's sort of a fun little gamification of like, can I start pushing that up as I sort of improve uh, the property, get more reviews? Like, and as much as I would have loved to have start with a performance score of like a uh, hundred, like you know that's that's not possible. And and maybe a, a a note for our our team is like the ability to track your performance score over time. I think could be fun. Um, but yeah, like I'm still like like fifteen percent below my competition in terms of occupancy. I'm a little bit above my competition in terms of rate. So now it's all about that sort of how can I use my uh, dynamic pricing tool to adjust rate in the right way so that I can push my occupancy higher. Knowing you, you have a KPI to get this to 90 by the end of November. <laughs> it's just now, I'm, as you know, like the whole seasonality stuff is, is really tough. Like moving from in this market, like peak season, um, October, November, then to like January, at like the doldrums. So we're going to go from peak to trough really quickly. Like I had done a whole bunch of research on optimal time to launch. And it was like two months before peak season. So I, I missed that window. It kills me because I know like what the overall revenue boost you can get by launching prior to peak season. Like it's significant. So yeah, I and mean, now it's... I mean, um, going to be a race to, to, to push it higher. Well, when that booking window comes around for next peak season, you'll have a whole repertoire of five-star reviews on, on the listing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jamie. Well, maybe you throw the hot dog costume back on. You probably got some trick-or-treaters coming your way. Maybe you're going, are you, are you trick-or-treating tonight? Oh yeah. We've got, um, 
my two sons. Um, one is going to be a Minecraft character and the other is going to be Mario. Uh, so uh, cuteness uh, abound. And then my nephew is dressing up as uh, Lightning McQueen. Uh, so whole family's coming over. We're going to grill out and go trick or treating with all the kids. So it's going to be a fun time. That sounds ideal. What kind of, what kind of candy can a, a child expect at the Lane household when they come by? Uh, we, we're, we're going all in on, on Reese's play the Pay hits crowd favorite. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Do you, do you get uh trick or treaters at your place in San Francisco? Unfortunately, I do not. I, <laughs> no trick or treaters where I am. So now you can just go out and buy the candy that you want just yeah, in case a trick or treater just in comes. Ca- that's exactly right. I have the big bowl of candy just in case I get one. And if I have to finish it the rest of November, then I'll, I'll, I'll bear that burden. <laughs> well, Scott, this was an awesome episode. I uh, love sort of getting into some of these tangible things that hosts can be doing to interview their properties. So great conversation. Thanks for the chat, Jamie. Happy Halloween. Right. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween.